welcome to another episode of Oh What a Lovely Podcast, where popular culture meets the First World War. I'm Angus Wallace, and with me, as ever, is Jessica Meyer and Chris Kempshaw. There's just the three of us today, and we're going to be discussing a single thread by Tracy Chevalier with perhaps a detour... Uh, via higher wages from Dorothy Wimple. Now, Jessica, this is your suggestion. I think we need probably need to have an elevator pitch, don't we, on the on what a single thread's about for those people who've not read it. Well, well, there's sort of a wider question which I suggested a th- single thread as as a good way into, which is the subject of uh, textile crafts, so knitting and sewing primarily, um, and the war. A single thread is the story of a young woman who, or young-ish woman, she's 38, uh, Violet, who is very much in this book a surplus woman, as it is understood in popular culture. And we might come into to, to the meaning of surplus women at some point in this discussion. Um, but she, she's a single woman who's lost her fiancé in the war, is unmarried at 38, is trying to make a living as a secretary, um, and has moved out of her mother's house so that she doesn't become a carer for her mother and the problems of care for the elderly is um, as well as others is is a theme throughout the book and she moves to Winchester and becomes one of the broderers um, at uh, Winchester Cathedral um, sewing the cushions and hassocks um, which were being designed and I'm going to forget the woman's name Louisa Pestle Lisa Pestle, thank you, who was a real person and who has an archive at Leeds, which I now need to go and take a look at at some point, um, I discovered from the end notes. And it's, it's the story of her relationships and, and living in early 1930s Britain. There are all sorts of historical issues with it, but it does have this subject of sewing and the idea of sewing as women's work and as the work of surplus women in particular at its heart. It also has some bell ringing in there as well um, with a nod to Dorothy L. Sayers. So we might, we might talk a little bit about sort of country craft and, and activities in general at some point, but I really wanted to talk about, about the way in which sewing, knitting was an important part of the war and the war's aftermath. And this is, this is sort of for my, my stitching group. I, 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 am set, I am knitting at the moment. I'm holding up my knitting, uh, my son's sweater for my co-presenters to see I am teaching myself to quilt as well so I do a bit of sewing but I belong to a stitching group that does all sorts of different handicraft of various types um, and a lot of embroidery and some of them are now listeners to this podcast so hello um, Euro Stitchers Um, some of the discussions we've been having in that group made me think this is actually a subject in its own right for discussion. It is a, a cultural uh, and increasing popular cultural in, in the world today. There was a, an article about yarn bombing and the popularity of yarn bombing among the 18 to 25 year olds in the newspaper last week. So a lot of people are involved in sewing and in knitting and there are strong legacies from the First World War that I think would be interesting to discuss. So that's, that's why I suggested this topic. It is absolutely central to the book. I mean, there is a huge amount of time taken to explain embroidery and what happens and how it works for the uh, uninitiated. Yeah, I, I know an awful lot more about different types of stitches than I did beforehand or necessarily thought I would ever need to. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not an embroiderer. Should we start with that? Um, I cross stitch. I've done a bit of cross stitch. I know what a French knot is. I can't do them. I'm really bad at French knots. Um, I can do some back stitch, and you know, for for the quilting that I'm doing, I do a lot of running stitch. But I'm I'm not a, a an open work embroiderer or, or a, um, a canvas embroidery. I think is is uh, what's mainly being discussed in this book. And one of the things that I found interesting, quite frustrating about it, is this idea of sewing, particularly sewing as a woman's activity is just discussed in this book as this, what, what I think at the time would have been referred to as fancy work, um, decorative embroidery, and not even for the decoration of clothing, but for uh, uh, for things like kneelers and cushions. And to be fair, you know, there is a lot of middle-class embroidery in the 20th century. There is an awful lot of, of that. Um, and particularly by the middle of the century, when you start to get mass-produced clothes, but at the time, a lot of women would have sewed to mend clothes, to make clothes. You know, mass-produced clothing isn't particularly dominant in the early 20th century. 
making clothes is time consuming and expensive. Mending clothes is something that everybody does, patching and darning. And I know my mother, who is at school, you know, at, at boarding school in the 1940s, 1950s, had very vivid memories of being taught how to darn and to be taught how to mend sheets, you know, basic mending. So there's actually a lot of sewing going on that isn't the sort of sewing that's being discussed in a single thread. And the focus in the book is very much on this, uh, on this is sewing as a mystery, as something that that isn't known about by other women outside this birders group, and that and that that Violet passes on to her niece. There, there's there's an interesting element of, of generational transfer of learning the skills of sewing first from the experts, uh, Louisa Pestle and Mrs. So I'm really not doing well with the names in this book, am I? To begin something like that. Yeah, something like that. And and they do sampler work. You know, they they make samplers of stitches, and and they develop skills, and then they pass this on. They have to teach somebody else. Is one of the the exercises that the birders have to do. So it's treated as a mystery and a and a learned skill. And yet, my my sense is that sewing would have been a really common skill among women, particularly middle-class women struggling to make ends meet, as Violet is, who would have had to mend her own clothes. She wouldn't have had money to buy new clothes. So quite why, it, I, I, I found that quite disconcerting. I mean, there's all kinds of symbolism, I think, with the embroidery. Is it not splitting it out, though, from being, this is a hobby, this is a craft, as opposed to a make-do-and-mend uh, thing? So it, it, it becomes a class thing. So you, it's the middle class who has the leisure time to to can sit and undertake this artistic um, skill, and and, and it also you know, this idea of passing on the skills is representative, perhaps, of, uh, of a continuity of time. You know, and not only that, they're passing on the skills, but they're producing needles, and it's very needlers, sorry, and it, she's very clear how she wants that needler to be there in a hundred or two hundred years time. So it it. it, it it is a continuity of something left over from her as as with the passing on of the skill yes i th- i think so but that sort of decorative work it is a skill but it's not one that would have been exclusive to the middle classes even if the practice of it as a leisure activity or to, for the glory of god which i think you know and and having it in parallel with the more ephemeral bell ringing it, it's made quite explicit that this is something for the community and for the you know f- for heritage rather than and and for the church rather than f- for self but you do have a tradition of decorative embroidery on clothing that working class women lower middle class women would have made for the middle classes to purchase the middle classes wouldn't have made their own highly decorated you know clothing themselves but they would have they would have bought in hand embroidery and this is in in terms of fashion this is a period where haute couture the idea of the handmade clothing exquisitely made and often exquisitely embroidered as a as a woman's profession and i think that's what's quite interesting is that that something that was a profession that women did and did outside the home from the 19th century, potentially in producing these as fashion items, in this book becomes presented as um, a a leisure skill for the middle classes rather than a way of earning a living, very much in comparison to Violet's way of earning a living as a secretary in a male-dominated office, where it's shown as being very limited. She's never paid enough. Nobody understands how hungry she is. And that's why I suggested high wages as the comparative volume, because what you get in that is a story of a young woman, Jane, who goes out and founds her own business selling it's a haberdashery shop she's selling clothes she's she's trading on her skills as an upwardly mobile young woman to set up this shop and to to make clothes for the middle class women of her northern you know small northern town that then by the end she's looking towards moving to london and setting up in london so it it's it's about and that's about women's work in the interwar period is she a surplus woman well her love interests, she has two love interests in the book. One of them is married to someone else and one of them has lost an arm. 
And she doesn't end up with either of them. Instead, she has become an independent woman in her own right by the end of the book. High Wages is written in the interwar period. Chevalier's novel is written in the early turn of the, the 21st century, she, in the early 2000s. It's a very interesting shift. You know, the, the myth of the surplus woman has moved so far away from what I think the reality was for young women or what would have been called the new woman. You know, my, my, my feeling about surplus women is that, first of all, it's not a new phenomenon in the interwar period. As, a, as a, a myth of the war, this narrative that all these women lost their potential husbands, it does a huge disservice to all these young women who were actually may or may not have wanted to get married, but, but went out and found jobs and traded on the skills that they had as women to become independent. And that's what I think Dorothy Whipple is celebrating in a way that I don't think Chevalier is, is, is at all. And that, and that I find quite frustrating that there's, there, is a, there is a strong, much stronger feminist narrative about what women actually did in the interwar period than this idea that, that women had to be independent because they lost their potential husbands. The difference might be to bow down to class again. So Jane's a, Jane, is a is a living origin. She lives in the shop. She works out for haberdashers, and she slowly trades her way up. She's a person of trade, working class. Whereas is Violet actually perhaps is her embroidery a statement of her her being single and unable to find a, a husband, and, and a way of marketing herself as as being available because, and and, and a. A, a sales pitch. I can do embroidery. Look, you know, I I can. So why why will you not take me on? And there's a perception in from Chevalier that this is what these uh, surplus women were doing to try and make themselves more available. I I wonder if it's about making themselves available to men or making themselves look. I, I am a useful person for society. I have a societal worth. Just because you know, I, I'm not going to get married. I'm you know, I'm 38 now. My time has clearly passed. Um, I'm, I'm far too old to ever be uh, to ever be married again. But look, I can I can embroider now. I have a I have a use. I have a, a role to play in this very kind of quantified societal position in in Winchester, um, and therefore I'm not useless or not entirely useless. Chevalier has a section, um, and again, it's it's when Violet returns home to her family in Southampton, where, where the embroiders are discussed as spinsters in the literal sense of those who, who span, which, which is where I, I started thinking, but actually you're ignoring all these other textile skills that women would have had to have had just to do the sort of domestic work that Violet is trying to, 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 to escape, you know, that, that is useful work. Between spinning and embroidery, there's a whole range of other textile skills, some of which are day to day, but which can be elaborated into creativity. Um, but those day to day skills are hugely useful. And one of the uses that Violet tries to escape from is caring for her elderly mother. Now, her, the elderly mother is a gorgon. Don't get me wrong. She's not an attractive character. And you, you don't want Violet to end up caring for her because it's not it's not her proper job in the universe that Chevalier has created. Um, But somebody does need to care for her. And it's a problem that Violet and her brother and his wife face. And ultimately the the person who does end up caring for her is someone who's trained as a teacher, (laughs) you know, and care, care for the elderly becomes something that's, that's an adjunct to teaching Latin. Where, you know, when, when this woman loses her job teaching Latin, she finds refuge with Violet, mother as her carer I can't remember if she is looking for jobs in teaching by the end she and her her partner have moved in and and will jointly care so 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 that woman's role becomes something that isn't work isn't useful work for women to do or 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 useful work that, that, that that's being rejected by the author which is interesting because there was a there was a feminist campaign at the time and I can't remember the dates exactly because it does run up into the post Second World War period. It gets reiterated, but it certainly exists in the interwar period for women to be paid for housework, for housework to be acknowledged as women's work, paid labor and useful in that sense. Um, so this idea of, of what is useful women's work, I think, is really quite interesting and quite problematic in this book. In regards to kind of the the, the, the very good point you're making about, you know, 
embroidery would have been kind of fairly present in various forms in society during this time period but also particularly it expands massively during the war we all know that endless things about men need socks men need things in the trenches um it would have become uh, ubiquitous and yet appears to have like died off as if that was war work and most women now don't need to do that anymore but is there a very specific divide on what you're calling embroidery so there's a royal school of needlework and i don't suppose they uh sanction dining socks um, yeah, so do you get this class divide where, where uh, certain work is classed as just day-to-day sewing and other work is classed as a, a craft? Well, but except, that, except that the first thing that happens in 1914 in terms of mobilisation is that men are mobilised, come and volunteer. Women are told there aren't enough uniforms. Or knit. You know, si- sister, it was sister Susie's sewing shirts for soldiers is one of those... Uh, musical ditties that appears in 1914, which is about telling women that, you know, your brothers are going off to fight. You need to make sure he's warm and comfortable. So knit him socks, sew his shirts. So, you know, make bandages for the Red Cross. It's uh, Elsie Inglis who's told to go away and knit, essentially, rather than volunteering as a doctor. So, So that process of sewing is seen as war work. The class thing, it's pitched to to everyone, but particularly the middle classes and, you know, Janet Watson's analysis of the the way in which VAD, young VADs saw their work as the volunteering equivalent of their brothers volunteering for the new armies. A temporary wartime role, yes, but something appropriate for young middle class women to do. Sewing for soldiers, knitting for soldiers, in some ways bears the same burden. You know how to do this. You have been taught how to do this. You may have been taught how to do this via samplers as as a leisure activity or, you know, an appropriate accomplishment for a young woman. But now you can you can do it usefully as war service uh, rather than, you know, going out and spending money or, um, you know, being lazy or doing whatever it is that young women are not supposed to do when the world is at war. <laughs> I think, yes, Angus, you're right. There is a divide between sewing as, as accomplishment and sewing as practical skill. But in wartime, the practical skill becomes the one with the higher status. But after the war, do you gain a, a class status from being embroidery, which is culturally expressive, as opposed to sewing, which might be a, a DIY or a repair or a home improvement? And it's very culturally expressive when you're making kneelers. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things is if, if you're talking about a world in which, you know, you've had an economic slump and you do have women who need to go out, you know, young women who wouldn't have necessarily expected to go out to work, who need to go out to work, not necessarily because they can't get married, but because the, their financial situation has changed in general, who are being told, well, isn't it a good thing that you know how to do solid practical sewing now? Not because you're going to do that to make a living, but because it means you can mend your own your own clothes and you don't need to buy more you know there 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 is a i think that the don't be extravagant narrative from the war persists particularly once you get into the the post-war slump and then the wall street crash so so this idea of make do and mend you know it's, it's not a specific wartime idea in the way it becomes in the in the second world war but it is you know female extravagance becomes in dress becomes something slightly unacceptable for the middle classes in a way that I don't think it was before the war. There's an interesting extra element about the kind of the concept of uh, embroidery, sewing and the like as the difference between the the stuff, the the thing you do every day at home or it being a skill. Um, And I think it's kind of the, 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 to my mind, the modern equivalent is, and it's, again, it's a, it's a kind of a hugely sexist construct that, you know, at home, women cook because it's a boring everyday thing, but chefs are men because it's a skill. Um, and you get that weird kind of playoff that, you know, the, the moment it becomes important, you need an artist to do it. And that artist will undoubtedly be, uh, be male. Um, so when I was working for um, the Sussex First World War Project during uh, centenary, um, I'm going to hold it up to the camera. It's useless to everybody listening at home um, because you don't have a camera. Uh, got contacted by a, uh, a group who were working on um, kind of the history of the altar frontal and memorial book at St Paul's Cathedral. 
um, and they put together a book called From the Hands of Heroes. And the altar front at St Paul's Cathedral was created and embroidered by wounded First World War soldiers in camps, kind of recovery convalescence camps during the war and afterwards. And it was partly kind of taught to them as a rehabilitation approach, but also to kind of to give them uh, something resembling a skill. But it's it's that skill thing. The second it becomes skilled, it's acceptable for a man to do. And you still have the altar front there today created by these soldiers i believe so there's actually a really interesting debate that um both alexia moncrief and anna carden coin have contributed to which is about the nature of this hospital work you know the the use of embroidery and this is fancy work again this is this is decorative this is not the um it's not utilitarian making, no it's not utilitarian um uh and Anna Carden Coin's written about there's a whole series of butterflies that that get embroidered. And Alexia has talked about the Australian soldiers at uh, Harefield Hospital who uh, embroider. One of the things they make actually it's an overall, but it is so highly decorated that it's not very useful as you know a keeping your your house coat clean type overall. But it, it, it's full of Australian symbolism, um, and and they really draw on their their identity as Australians. But they are taught by women how to do this. So in some ways, the women are, you know, just as Louisa Pestle is in, in the book, you know, are the, are the ones with the skill and the knowledge um, in this. And I, I'm not quite sure I agree with that interpretation, you know, that, that at the time these men would have been seen as, as skilled in the way we, you know, that, that, that idea of it as an art. Um, it is seen in the way that men with facial disfigurements are taught to make toys, for instance, and, and, and things like that, as giving the disabled tools or the, the wounded activities to keep them occupied. Now, Anna talks about this as a feminization of these men, you know, these men having to become feminized as part of their recuperative process so that then they can relearn how to be men after that. Um, Alexia sees this as a rather more complex relationship where the the women's skill is is actually acknowledged far more um and there is there is a distinctiveness between the women who are adept at the sewing and the men who are learning how to sew so there's slightly different interpretations of it but it is worth remembering that sewing is used as a recuperative process for these men a way of healing but even men who weren't wounded were sewing and this is back to the utilitarian aspect of it, um, that men in the front line, you know, once they're deployed, they are responsible for their kit. They have to learn to sew on buttons. They have to learn to, um, to sew, you know, damage to their uniforms. They will still be inspected on the quality of their uniform. Now, they go into reserve, they have a bath, their clothes are sent to be cleaned and have the lice removed by local French women, who are the washerwomen who are employed to do this. So I'm talking about the British Army here. Chris, if you have thoughts on what happens to the Americans and the French in this context, that would be interesting. And, and a lot of things are mended there. There are, there are spaces in which women are employed to do sort of mass mending. But day to day, men are sewing. And there is a piece of soldier's kit that dates certainly from the 18th century, called the Hussif, which is written housewife. And it, it's a sewing kit, essentially. But it is something that men need to have to, to, to maintain comfort and appearance day to day. And comfort and appearance are really important to men's morale. And you get in letters home, lots of men boasting, I can sew a button on now, dear. Aren't I well domesticated? <laughs> so men take a lot of pride in, in learning these skills. And, and this is true of the men in hospital as well. They, they have show, you know, showing exhibitions of fancy work that the local uh, community come and see. And so men sewing, men doing this work in wartime, it has a different meaning from women doing it. It's not service the way it is for women, but it's really, really important that men are doing this work as well. And it's not seen as being stigmatized. Um, so th that you can talk about the, to write about the early 1930s as a period where this, you know, it's, it's so gendered and so stigmatized and it's about being, that, that sewing is associated with being a single woman. What's happened to all that, that cultural, 
understanding of sewing as something that men do, as something that women do as war service. Um, so I, I had, yeah, I, I think there's a lot more at the time going on with, with textile crafts in British culture than Chevalier brings out in this book. It's the 20s, though, that the embroidery is, uh, you know, it, 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 is still in the public sphere for for men returning. So, nineteen twenty seven, George V, who I think from nineteen nineteen had visited an annual uh, ex servicemen's embroidery uh, event, uh, which amused me that um, he was the, the king was introduced to the men by uh, Air Marshal Hugh Trenchard, went round and introduced each men, which I, I, I thought was it, you know the, a high ranking military man who was, was was introducing these men. And there is a guild of soldier and sailor broiderers, which opens on Oxford Street in 1918 by uh, Lady Titchfield. Um, so it does, it just it carries on into the post war period. But again, is that if you're forming a guild, is that not creating a craft ra- and separating it into try, almost trying to make this specialist embroidery more of a men's task, like what you're saying about oh, who's a chef and not a cook? But 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 then that doesn't fit in with Chevalier's representation of a guild as female dominated and and women's work and something that that sets women who can't get themselves a husband because they lost one they lost their fiancés in the war and appears to be a skill that is basically extinct in the wider world except for um within these these organizations don't get me wrong it's a good book in the sense that it's you know quite an enjoyable narrative um i read it on holiday and and it was a good holiday read but it, as a piece of history it it was frustrating because that central theme, she's trying to put too much weight on it and missing out what for me is the really interesting history of this, which is the way in which those themes of the war become part of life. And I I wanted this to be a single thread about the way the the war experience got woven into the post-war period, not cut off and separated from it, which is, Chevalier wants this as this is this is Violet's wartime identity, and through sewing, she emerges into this new I, I, independent identity, which allows her to find fulfillment and, and motherhood, even, which I thought was really interesting as a, as a as an ending point for a feminist argument about female independence. Well, it's inter- interesting that from a motherhood point of view, she has to find a sixty-year-old to be the father, a married six-year-old at that, <laughs> which comes back again to this idea of surplus women, and it's just impossible to find anybody under the age of sixty who's they also, who's single. Nineteen thirty-two, and they're all obsessed about whether someone's married or not. And I'm thinking, I'm not, I'm not sure that's that's quite right. And 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 the the scandal over the lesbian love affair, which. I found quite interesting thinking back to our discussion of, of blasted things, where again you have a same-sex female relationship, which again is just which I, I found much more convincing, particularly women's same-sex relationship. I can imagine male same-sex relationships which bore with them the threat of legal punishment and arrest, but women's same-sex relationships aren't under quite the same threat. So even in a small town, I can't imagine there being quite that much scandal. There are female same-sex relationships in interwar British fiction all over the place, can I just point out. There are two of them in Dorothy L. Sayers' uh, Unnatural Death. One of them is viewed very positively. <laughs> um, one of them is is seen as being um, predatory. Um, there's The Well of Loneliness gets banned. But that's more about how explicit it was rather than, than the existence of, of a female same-sex relationship in it. It's hardly a same-sex relationship in uh, a single thread. Uh, if she didn't tell you they were sort of in a relationship, it was just two women wanted to uh, live in the same house together. There's th- there's nothing in it. There's hardly any romance to it. There's nothing overt out it, within society. That, that She just says, you know, we like each other. We want to be to live together. It, it's not overt at all. You, I mean... If you had, if you hadn't have said, if I, if you, no one had mentioned the word lesbianism, lesbianism, you could have easily overlooked it as just two women wanting to live together. It's so subtle. There, there, there's an interesting discussion in queer history about the extent to which, as historians, we can understand same-sex couples living together. Whether we should assume that they were just friends or that they were in some sort of sexual or romantic relationship, not assuming that sex and romance necessarily go together um and i think you know 
that's true. And there's certainly cases where same-sex relationships have been dismissed as they were just friends. But the other thing that's going on in this period in terms of these young women in financial situations is that, you know, in, in precarious financial situations, is that young women are moving into boarding houses. You know, they are living with other women in the same house in, you know, in separate rooms with it, as is portrayed here, you know, Violet's living in one of these boarding houses with other women, um, with a landlady. And that's really very common. So, so when you talk about living with other women, the nature of what we mean when we talk about living with other women, and that's possibly quite different from setting up a household together, you know, as, as partners in, in the way that, that happens with this couple. It's easy to go too far in both directions to both dismiss the existence of of same sex relationships, um, particularly women's same sex relationships, because they're just friends. But also to say, well, any any two women living together must be in a romantic partnership or or um, have same sex desire. As with anything historical, it's always more complex than that. Um, and there are, are economic reasons for women setting up household together, and it being that being seen as respectable at the time. I thought it was interesting that when they needed someone to move in with the mother who was going to be, you know, kind and nurturing enough to look after her, but firm enough not to put any up with any of her nonsense. They didn't the teacher. They brought a lesbian in who apparently crosses all of these um, spheres um, and can be, you know, all things to all people. But there's a there's a weird element in that that actually, you know, you know. Uh, a straight woman wouldn't be wouldn't be strong enough to deal with um, uh, to deal with this woman. So they're going to have to bring in someone, someone else who will be able to cross the threshold in some way, which I thought was a little, a little interesting. Yeah. And, and, and that she's a teacher. There, there are ma- there are anxieties about predatory lesb- older lesbian women um, circulating at the time. But yeah, I, I agree. It's it's interesting who takes who is seen as appropriate for taking on that caring role. Can I do one of my major bugbears with with the book? It's and it's to do with the temporal framing of the book in the way that it looks back towards elements of the past, but doesn't look forward towards elements of the future. And the opening few chapters of the book are so incredibly heavy handed in reminding you how long ago the First World War was. Um, Now, there's there's an element of, you know, with writing, you know, don't show the or don't tell the reader, show them. And sometimes that works. And sometimes I think that's a little overrated. But the first two chapters of the book are over and over and over again. Oh, you know, if I count back 18 years to the beginning of the war in 1914, this person would have been this age, which means that 18 years since the beginning of the First World War was passed. So now because it's been 18 years last year, it was 17 years. And now it's been 18 years, which means it's been 18 years. since. For the love of God, you don't need to keep telling me how long ago the first world war was have at least a little bit of faith in your readership that they can count at the very least but also the way that you know in regards to the point that you know embroidery has completely died out in the interwar years there's this element that in some way the first world war remains this all-consuming most important thing but various parts of society have completely warped beyond recognition and some parts have stayed incredibly the same um, and I found that constant harking back to the dates, the dates of the war over and over and over again, in case the readership had lost count of the dates, hugely annoying. But there is a rather awkward looking forward as well, because because suddenly at the end, you suddenly get what's happening in Germany and the Chancellor. And there's this very brief sort of one of the characters gets incredibly anxious about this. I just like, Ugh. <laughs> That's the other half of my rant in that um, are we worried too much about spoilers? I mean, there aren't, it's not a book that is particularly spoiler-esque. The, there's, there's, there's an issue with the Arthur, who's the, who's the love interest, kind of comes across one of these, these cushions and it's got what he perceives to be swastikas sewn into it. And they've got, and then Louisa Pestle comes in and goes, no, 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 no. It's a completely different symbol. It's a historic symbol. Look, it's all, it's all over here in the church, which, given the context that makes it a bit weird but um you know we're reclaiming it as an act of rebellion and you know reclaiming it as an act of rebellion you know there's something to be to be said for that however there's this element within that that you know in due course the 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 image of this this symbol as a swastika will die out and it will return to the historical version that we all know and love and that'll be our act of rebellion i'm reading it going i don't think it will 
Um, it's all right for the characters to to think that, but I'm very much wondering if Tracy Chevalier thinks that at some point the Schwarzenegger will be reclaimed. <laughs> that 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 was that was that was the point where, having seen the end notes, I thought actually I'd really like to go into the Louisa Pestle archive in Special Collections at the Brotherton Library and see is she writing about this? Or you know is because that actually felt like a bit of research that that this might actually be what Louisa Pestle thought and wrote at the time um that Chevalier is putting in there so um yes uh at some point I will go make use of the lovely new reading rooms in special collections at Leeds and uh, and pull up the Louisa Pestle archives so yeah to see how she's written at length about the reclamation of the swastika yeah um you know th- there may be you know long correspondence where she's talking to someone about this um and, and I will let you know <laughs> <laughs> this is the case. It just goes back to continuity, doesn't it? When you, you know, the, 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 they'll be there for hundreds of years, you know, the nailers. You know. But just just picking up on that that point about, you know, the first half of of, of your your rant, Chris, was that need to to reinforce how long ago it was. It's the problem with the paradigm shift view of the war that this was this great social shift in Britain, which it wasn't. And it, that's back to, to my personal rant about surplus women. Because in addition to the, the really underrepresenting the, the motivations and the, and the labor of, of young women in the interwar period, the surplus women narrative tends to ignore the fact that the term surplus women existed from the 1860s, I think is the first OED reference. Um, that that scholars have identified this this idea, and it, it refers to the middle classes almost entirely. This idea that there are more women needing husbands than there are husbands for them. What happens in the interwar period is, and there, there was actually um, the the Times archive. Uh, they they publish an archive piece every day, and and the, uh, there was one a couple of days ago where the the there was a leader about all you know needing to send women overseas to join men who'd emigrated looking for work but the anxiety was less about the loss of men to the war yes they are reflecting on the 1921 census showing that there are more women in britain than than there are men uh 2.1 million i think but their interpretation is not all these men died in the war you know a, a lost generation their interpretation is all these men have emigrated looking for new jobs overseas in the empire. We need to send the women after them. And there, there is, you know, in various parts of um, rural Canada, for instance, there is still, a, you know, an, a, more men than women. And this is a problem for, for gender relationships in those contexts. So there's a much more complicated story about empire and global economics and the movement of labor going on here than than just the the war changed everything well yes the war changed a huge amount don't get me wrong but there are also story you know there are continuities from the pre-war period through the war into the post-war period that the war might enhance or might alter but but they're still there um and and yeah i i'm i'm absolutely with you chris the sort of everything happened in 1918 and then nothing has changed since and you're thinking well there was a major slump there was a general strike there was yeah you know what happens to all of the 1920s um, that just sort of disappears and everything's attributed to the war violet attributes everything by age as well doesn't she you either are old enough to serve or, or, or old enough to remember, or you, or you have no inkling of what happened, so we can dismiss you. Which, which or, or, I, oddly, I think, I think in one of the early episodes of Peaky Blinders, or maybe one of the later episodes of Peaky Blinders, something comes up. You, you know, he talks about what you know, your war generation's over. It's now, it's now for us to take over. But actually, that's that's absent in a, a single thread. It's just kind of you, know, you either understand or you don't understand because you're either served or you've lost. Or you, you have no idea at all because you were too young to understand. So there's Mo and Olive, who who she works with. I have no understanding of the war because they were too young. They were just too young. So, so, that, so it's just dismissed. 
it's flippantly dismissed that they're yeah they're just flippant because they don't understand the war. We're serious because we we were there. We understand the war, which is completely absent in higher wages, where the war's just a speed bump. Even though Wilfred comes home with his hand, his arm missing, he's just a bit glum for a while, uh, and, and then gets back to it. I mean, it, it's there a bit more than that because there's that lovely scene where Jane helps him cut up his meat, which is which is such a pivotal scene for her. And what, what I one of the things I love about high wages, it's not that it's 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 ignored. It's that the war happened. The war was. It still affects lives. But you know what? Lives move on. I think without the war, Jane's ability to set up her business would have been very different. And I think the the novel acknowledges that. Um, But it's not this paradigm shift. It's not, you know, things were before there was the war out of time and then things after. Um, this feeling that the war was the defining moment of your life. And if it wasn't, then you were either too young or you didn't understand it. You weren't paying attention. Um, the war becomes the, 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 the sun that everything else orbits around to varying degrees of gravity. In high wages, you get the moment where Noel actually admits he thoroughly enjoyed the war. You know, I, I enjoyed the war. Frankly, everything after it's been a bit rubbish, which you would never get in a single thread. You know, that, that kind of... Uh, opposite opinion that it was just doom and gloom and misery and it's been rubbish ever since i wondered about that with tom actually in a single thread because obviously he served he lost his brother um violet lost her fiance and you know there's a traditional tom never speaks about what he saw in the war but he doesn't appear to be utterly mortified by what happens he's not traumatized and i did kind of wonder whether or not he just had a boring war service or a reason, you know, a, an enjoyable war service. And for, that's the reason why he doesn't talk about it. I, I might be reading a little too much into it, but I thought it interesting how everybody else was very willing to talk about how awful the war had created circumstances for them. And Tom never talks about it, but is not traumatised. And I, I've said elsewhere, you know, we need to talk about these men who enjoyed the war. So back to my Sayers obsession in... Um, is it unnatural? No, it's unpleasantness at the Bologna Club where Robert Fentiman has a good war. You know, he enjoys the war. Now, that isn't seen as being necessarily a positive thing by certainly by his brother George, who is traumatized by it. But here you have but, but it is an acknowledgement that there are men who had good wars or boring wars or, you know, came out even if they were physically traumatized in some way, psychologically able to cope. And I think. That that's what I get out of Wilfred. The other thing, the other thing about Wilfred's injury is that, and and the way the war shapes, you, you know, for Noel, it's that nothing's ever that exciting again, um, and, and post-war world is a bit boring. For Wilfred, he's given the opportunity to become a librarian because of his war injury, isn't he? He's picked up by his his patron for his post-war job because of his war injury. And even though he's he's an autodidact prior to the war, it, his war service is his social mobility comes to the war in the same similarly to the way James does that it provides opportunity that he wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, and I think that's where the war changes things. That there are, it, it's not that society shifts entirely, but for individuals there are different sets of opportunities that they can take advantage of. Higher wages, you could also say in, in the reverse, it's the, the decline of the middle classes as the um, uh, as Noel's family loses his money. And Mrs Briggs, who's the working class, whose husband's desperate to drag her into the upper class when all the money disappears, she's thoroughly thrilled to go back to the corporation houses. And thankfully, Jane has, has provided her with enough money for them to live comfortably. Uh, so it's it, 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 the fall of the, the wealthy. And, and, and the aspirational middle class, yeah. No, yeah. but 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 that only works if you have a, a pre-war aspirational middle class to fall. <laughs> We've been quite a long way from um, textiles and embroidery here. Um, just just to bring it back to that, and and I know we're talking about these books, but it's just to to come back to to the the work you did, Chris, with the with the St Paul's altarpiece. There there were quite a lot of centenary. You know the mobilization of of these crafts because I I did some work 
with um, a woman called Agnes Smallwood, uh, who who worked with the Legacies of War project on our 2018 peace, you know, uh, an armistice uh, commemorations, creating peace banners with the Leeds City Museums, where uh, groups contributed embroidery about what peace meant to them. So it wasn't just First World War related. It um, covered a range of cultures in in Leeds and West Yorkshire. And you, you'll be pleased to know that I I cross stitched a cornflower. Uh, Chris, um, because I didn't want to do poppies. Um, perhaps we should explain why a cornflower is so significant. It's 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 the French version. It's the French kind of memorial flower, the blue cornflower, which is... and Italian, I think the Italians use it as well. Oh, I don't know about that. Um, what Italy were in the First World War? <laughs> the weird thing about the French cornflower, just to kind of, I'll just drift away briefly, is that you can only get it in such a narrow period of time the kind of the you know poppy season in this country seems to go from about i don't know november the 12th to about october the 31st uh time period when you can buy it because you know expands ever outwards and then consumes you but in, in france it's a very narrowly defined acceptable period to buy and sell cornflowers and wear them which i think is super interesting is is there an equivalent of the british legion which which produces cornflower memorabilia there is because i got mine i bought mine online um i had one in i got one when i was in france in 2008 for the 90th 90th anniversary of the end of the war and it fell apart shortly afterwards so i had to find mine online and there is like a the it's not quite the rbl equivalent i don't think but it's it you know it's a similar type set up that you can kind of get them from from there yeah i can't remember what it's called but that just just to bring it back to sort of textile work the royal british legion from the start is producing them in factories in richmond and in in edinburgh the the lady haig factories after douglas haig's wife but they're silk to begin with so these are wounded men disabled men producing silk emblems for sale to support them um, and, and to return them to work in any very similar to, to, to the to embroidery as skill in hospitals. This is the, there's a lot of that sort of project, um, not not just at textile skills, but, but craft skills in general that are being promoted in the early 20s for disabled men. One of the most used kind of ad, for advertising and images like from the Imperial War Museum is one of those um, silk poppies. They use it all the time uh, as one of the original Hague ones. And there's a very, very famous poster of the the Earl Hague, the, the one in Richmond's Earl Hague and, and the one in Scotland's Lady Hague. Um, but very famous image that I've used quite a lot in my research of the poppy factory um, that is held at the Imperial War Museum. So, yeah. As we drift from a single thread. <laughs> <laughs> Lose the thread. <laughs> Should we leave that there and... and, and... Are we, are, we, are we mind everything? Should we just should we just end with a read a single thread if you're interested, but definitely, definitely, definitely read High Wages. Um, I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Angus and I both loved it. I, I read it in about two or three days flat. It was just absolutely, and I was on holiday and it was just fabulous. Absolutely. I, th- I was slightly let down by the end, but I, I found it all absolutely unput downable yeah the, the the end the ending's a bit rushed but but the the rest of it is is really really good the ending's a bit rushed in a single thread as well to be honest given that the back says oh you know she has a terrible secret which could ruin everything and it only appears like the penultimate chapter but there we go so next time out chris what are we looking at well i'm pretty sure that for following our our um our kind of recent planning meeting that we've gone to go having now discussed single thread we're going to discuss something of a great kind of uh, a heavier more weighty subject of snoopy and the red baron um i'm pretty sure is 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 honing into view like a like a beagle on a, on a doghouse um <laughs> low on the horizon um we do just have to confirm our guest for that one <laughs> we do need to confirm our guests but i am super excited if we do end up doing um snoopy and the red baron because i am well on board for that yeah we just we just need to pin her down to a date so, so if everyone's homework, it's well worth uh, fishing out. I'm sure there, there's, there must be some available for free, but there is there is a uh, various compilations have been put out since I think the 60s. Yeah, there's going to be tons online. And I'm pretty sure that because it appears in quite a lot of the Charlie Brown Christmas and Charlie Brown TV show episodes, I bet you can watch them all on YouTube. Oh, I never thought of watching them. <sighs> I'll have to look those up. I, I, I th- I've read them all. I thoroughly enjoyed them. I thought they were brilliant. 
Absolutely brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. A really, a real pleasure to to go through. I just had a teaching job and one of the students put in an essay about Snoopy and the Red Baron and I ate it up. Well, it'll be my, a nice break from my marking to, to go and read, read those. Lovely. So hopefully we'll see everyone again discussing Snoopy. If not, it'll be something completely <laughs> random. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Thank you for indulging me with this one, guys. I really enjoyed it. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. And uh, until next time, bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.